Welcome back. So what happens now? Despite controlling the Senate, the House, and now the White House, the Republicans have failed for now to repeal and replace Obamacare, or just even repeal Ob Obamacare. Stating the obvious, this is not just a political story or a story about the politics of health care. It is about health care. The lives uh, are, there are lives on the line and livelihoods as on the line as well as Americans continue to deal with ever increasing insurance premiums, whether they get their coverage through the Affordable Care Act or employers insurance plans. And joining us for more on this health care costs is Keith Fitzgerald, a professor of political science at New College of Florida and a former Democratic representative in the Florida House. State Representative Julio Gonzalez, who represents South Sarasota County and who happens to be an orthopedic surgeon, and Sandra Bothoff, the chair of the University of South Florida's Department of Health Policy and Management. I can't think of a more distinguished panel to talk about this. Um, and Julio, or Representative, Sir. Um, I, let me start with you because in, in Kate's story you said you would be fine with going back to the situation as it was in 2007, but you saw the, the woman that she interviewed there who has a, a, a young daughter who is unsurable. Unsur and that is the conundrum that we face, is it not? Sure, and, and let's uh, specify the, the uh, situation that I wanted to go back to is as a policy analyst. If, if, if I had the opportunity to address the issues as they were presented back then, I would have come to a totally different solution than Obamacare. And the context of the comment was, uh, we really do need to go back now that we have this opportunity perhaps to repeal or do a partial repeal and analyze what are the specific problems and pass specific solutions, targeted solutions that will address problems like, like uh, the patient that you were talking about. In that case, it's really a matter of the, the simple solution for that is high-risk pools. You can definitely make high-risk pools for each of the uh, various states and it will cost fractions of, um, of what Obamacare ended up costing. Yeah, if you were there right now in Congress, uh, do you think that they tried to go too fast and, and get something done without thinking it through? Well, I don't know if it's without thinking it through. I, I think the numbers are stacked against them. I know that you have mentioned and other analysts talk about having the majority on, on uh, the three power st steeples of, of our country. But in point of fact, the margin in the Senate is only two senators. And uh, when you have that small a margin with something as complicated and with so many varying, valid varying opinions, it's very difficult to thread that needle. Uh, Professor, you study these issues for uh, a living. I, I would imagine if uh, there were easy solutions out there, great <laughs> minds like yourself and others would, would have found it right now. So, uh, you know, you, that we're, we're dealing with a situation where there is the, uh, the issue of health care in our country and politics, and that's uh, a dangerous combination, isn't it not? Yeah, I would say one of the things we really need to do a better job of focusing on is what are the cost drivers and how do we really start bending the cost curve on health care. And so I think, you know, the original Obamacare was, well, let's get everybody covered because then you don't have all this uncompensated care that delivery organizations are claiming, well, our costs have to go up because we're paying for all these uninsured. But I think really starting to look at the data to see, because a lot of times what works in one part of the country might, might not be the best solution for other parts of the country. And um, I do think that uh, it's, it's become more Obamacare, not Obamacare, as opposed to how do we bend the cost Keith, curve. that is one of the major problems here, is Obamacare may have covered more Americans and done a lot of good things that people agree with, like letting you, your kids stay on your plan until they're 26 years old, pre-existing you know, uh, uh, pre conditions, so forth. But it, it has not done enough to lower the cost of services. Yes, and I, I agree with that completely. One of the things that this exposes is the failure of our political system to be able to deal with complex issues in an effective way. Uh, both sides have been using this primarily as a symbolic issue to bash the other side. Um, uh, on the uh, Obamacare side, I think maybe the accomplishment was oversold in a way because this, uh, the Obamacare uh, bill never really transformed the delivery of health care or the cost drivers in a way that would lead to such great outcomes. On the other side, it was easy to say everything associated with a, a health care is terrible 
and it's all because of Obamacare, which was not really true. Uh, and it was easy to do that forever as long as you weren't responsible for fixing it. When it came time to try to fix it, uh, it was tough. It's right. not so easy. We are just getting uh, started with our conversation, and we will pick it right up after we check the weather. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are discussing health care costs in Florida and the debate over repealing Obamacare. Our guests tonight are Keith Fitzgerald of New College of Florida, State Representative Julio Gonzalez, who represents South Sarasota County and is a medical doctor, and Sandra Pothoff, who is the head of the USF uh, Department of Health Policy Management. Uh, welcome back. You know, Julio, I, I was talking to you earlier, and when we're talking about the costs uh, in our health care system, you believe you know, you, you have, you're on the front lines of this. Yeah. Um, what is the biggest cost drivers to you? Well, I think, you know, there's two ways. We, we've talked about costs and we mentioned the word cost. There's two ways of looking at costs. One is the macroeconomics cost. How much does it cost the whole country? But I think the, the bigger issue, the issue that I'm seeing in my practice on a day-to-day -day basis is how much does it cost to the patient? And we have, we have essentially three, three groups. We have the Medicare group, which with the uh, incursions of Medicaid, Medicare replacement and the increasingly uh, dismissive Medicare rules, the, the patients are bearing more of a brunt of uh, out-of-pocket expenses. The, the place where I think it has increased most dramatically has been in the private payer system, and I think that has been a, re a result of, of the mandates and, uh, and of the failure of getting a system that would be self-sufficient. And then the third one is the Medicaid system. And the Medicaid system is a different problem. Medicaid system is they don't have access. And we've talked about cost containment and, and bending the cost cur curve. We have had this obsession about getting people covered. That is absolutely the wrong answer, the wrong approach. The correct approach is to get people access to care. And that oftentimes meeting cutting, means you know, cutting their but costs. But when we've talked about different ideas here when, when you every time we've heard the the, the uh, congressional budget office score how many americans would lose lose health care coverage and you, you can't help but go back to uh, some of candidate trump's uh, comments uh... when he was running for elections where he promised time after time he was not going to support uh... A, an answer to this that uh... leaves americans to die on the streets right well i don't there is that is hyper the, the debate that has been going on about the 22 million the people that would lose coverage quote unquote uh, and how there's going to be some people have even said in the public uh, spectrum have said that 22 million people are going to die is just a falsity um, that is an absolutely uh, an absolute untruth now the, the again the problem becomes what is the best way to optimize access for people to have care? That doesn't necessarily mean for everybody that you have to be fully insured with all the bells and whistles. It again means, like we were talk talking about before, uh, interventions that would help um, cut costs, which in my opinion, the free market is the best at doing that. And secondly, uh, targeted solutions to the problems of healthcare so that people can have better access. Uh, professor, uh, obviously the politicians have not uh, crack the nut here. Uh, in the research world, are there good people out there thinking about how to accomplish these things without uh, people losing all insurance and, and being adequately covered? Well, I think one of the issues is, is health care really a free market market? And I don't know of other places, you know, other parts of, of uh, the market where you don't really know what things are priced at because that's the health insurance companies and the delivery sector kind of going behind closed doors to negotiate, right? So if you think about the delivery sector, we don't really know what the, co we always talk about the cost of health care, but we really don't know the true cost of health care. We know the charges. Mm. Charges and costs are two yeah. different things. Yeah. And until we make the charges at least more transparent especially now when you know people going to pay their co-insurance it's not just you pay a hundred dollars but you're paying a certain I, percentage of the charge I, I want to get into the politics of this but I do want to ask that question uh, you know is the problem of not understanding the charges themselves uh, not being addressed because both the Democrats and Republicans are so wrapped up in the politics of it. No, uh, you know, I don't think so. That's, um, you know, you really have to go back and look at this historically. Other countries do a heck of a lot better than we do in delivering health care in a high quality way at a much lower cost. And part of what we've done, decisions that were made 
back in the 1940s is we've allowed the providers of these services to set their own fees without, you know, there really isn't a market mechanism. If there were, other countries would have used it. Um, so the Obamacare idea was an effort to try to introduce some market um, uh, measures in the, in the sale of insurance, but they really didn't get to the root of the problem, which is we have the providers of the services determining what the price will be and also determining what the need is for the services in the first place. Totally disagree. The, the providers have absolutely no basis to set the price. And if you're going to talk about the provider, you're talking about people like me and, and perhaps even the hospitals. But definitely the health care providers, the people where the rubber meets the road, are not setting the price. The prices are set by the insurers. Well, for, and so, I'm, and I'm so, talking about, for one thing, pharma. And, and for so, another thing, and, uh, and the so uh, my technology. Solution, my solution would be, if, if uh, let me just finish the thought, because I have the solution for this. The solution for this is very simple. What you do is, number one, the reason why, why we have this issue is because the insurers are dictating the, uh, the fee for service. They're dictating how much you're going to get paid. You make fee for services not mandatory. And instead, what you do is you allow the patient to, to negotiate with the physician on non-emergency situations over the price. Whatever he comes under the recommended fee for service, the patient keeps half and the insurance keeps half whatever he goes over comes out of the patient. So now you have the patient have a stake on negotiating the price. Let me ask you all a, a political <laughs> question here because the president uh, had dinner last night with seven uh, Republican senators and he said something like this. If Republicans have the House, Senate, and the presidency and they can't pass this health care bill, they are going to look weak. How can we not do this after promising it for years? Keith? Well, they will look weak and they will own the failure. The problem that they've had is that they have been unable to specify a replacement for Obamacare that actually would perform better than it does. So you can talk about what 2007 was, it really doesn't matter. They haven't come up with anything better. I think one of the things that might look strong as opposed to weak would be if they actually made a serious approach to do some bipartisan negotiation. Somehow, somewhere along the line, we got confused about working across the aisle as a sign of uh, an absence of will and it would really be a good thing to get people together and actually talk about these problems pragmatically as opposed to strictly in partisan oh, do you think terms. that's possible? Um, it might have to, uh, not, whether it's possible or not, it might be necessary. And uh, I think the problem with the bipartisanship and this uh, sudden uh, interest in goodwill and uh, help from the Democratic side not speaking about Keith, but speaking about uh, what I'm hearing today in Congress, is that when, when the uh, Democrats had uh, the supermajority and they had a veto-proof majority, the Republicans were completely shut out. And the only reason why the bill passed on December 24th of whatever year it was is because there was a special election that changed the tide from a supermajority. There are still rough feelings and great animus because of that. Professor, I, we only have a couple of seconds left in this segment, but do you, for, from that perspective, do you think that a, a good uh, result can be accomplished without both parties buying into it? I think it has to be both parties, and I think it's just trying to figure out how to get past that. And I think in any Congress, you're going to have the small group of people that do know how to work across the aisles, and how do you bring them together and try and bring everybody else along. Let's take a quick break, and when we return, we'll have final thoughts from our guests, plus what some of our viewers are saying about last night's topic, a Confederate monument in Manatee County. Welcome back. Without the votes to replace Obamacare, will Republicans in the U.S. Senate move forward with repeal? What can be done to keep premiums from rising to, for everyday Americans? Our guests join us right now for final thoughts. So, Professor, let me start with you. Given that um, it doesn't seem that much of anything is happening in Congress, what can be done to at least um, you know, slow down the rise of health care costs? I think recognize that a lot of health care markets are local and bringing the community together to really look at what are the cost drivers in our community and how do we address that. Um, and I think getting back to the issue of price transparency, if we really want a competitive market and a market that works, then how do you make the prices at least more transparent so that you know what things are costing Bef ahead of time. And I think, you know, I like your idea about negotiating it, but if you look at the 3.2 trillion that's spent on health care, at least a trillion of that is 
the hospital costs. And so I think, you know, having to negotiate when you are in that situation, I don't know if that is realistic. Julio, when, when people watch what's been happening in the last couple of days and they, you know, they're loyal Republicans, they support the president, but they see that, geez, you know, we do have the White House, the Senate, and the House, and we have not been able to get this done. What do you tell them? Well, first, uh, you acknowledge the absolute reality of the situation, which is it's a really complicated issue. And if you got 50 Republicans who are not congresspersons or not members of the legislature, you got them together in a room, they probably would have just as difficult a time agreeing on what it should, what a future direction should look like as anybody else. It, it, it's funny because the president said not long ago, who knew it was so complicated? Complicated. I did, <laughs> but but I'll tell you I'll tell you um, what I think because you you had thought about closing comments and and if I end up not saying uh, any anything else uh, tonight, I, I think the impo there's there's an opportunity here for the American people for the people in our community, and that opportunity is to make sure that whatever you do, you demand that the decision making is uh, regarding your health care is done as close as possible to you. That means, in my opinion, a very small federal government footprint and a much bigger state and local footprint. Keith, much you like get the last saying. word. Well, we have to make some major changes, but we're not going to be making them this year with this president under these circumstances because the political system in Washington right now is pretty much ground to a halt. So we've got to do something short term to address the immediate problem. You mean pro propping up the, the, the markets right now as they are under Obamacare? Uh, yeah, I don't even think propping up is the right word. Uh, the, the problems are not quite as extensive as the people on the Republican side have uh, made them out to do immediately. Uh, these problems can be fixed in the short term if, as long as people come to the table and want them to be fixed. All right, we'll have to leave it there. But before we go, we want to share with you what, what some of our viewers are saying about last night's topic, Confederate monuments. There's a, a national de debate taking place over whether or not monuments to the Confederacy should be on public lands. Orlando had one moved to a cemetery. Hillsborough County is still debating whether or not to move theirs. And now an issue is picking up traction on the Sun Coast. There's a Confederate monument outside the Manatee County Courthouse. And we asked you what, if you you think it represents a symbol of heritage, hate, or something in between. Stacy Meath writes, heritage and history, leave it alone. Frank Watchhouse writes, long live the South. Bill Arthur writes, isn't there anything else to be proud of and connect your heritage to besides a losing war fought over owning other people? Surely there is something else to be proud of. Steve Doublestein writes, anyone who wants to fly a Confederate flag on private property can do so, but not any place that uses my tax dollars. We already have a flag that celebrates our history. That would be our red, white, and blue. And Sandra Bridges writes, so insistent was Lee on this extinguishing the fiery passions of the Civil War that he opposed erect monuments on the war's battlefields. I think it's wiser to, moreover, not to keep open the sores of war, but to follow the examples of those nations who endeavored to obliterate the marks of civil strife and commit to oblivion the uh, feelings it engendered, he wrote. Well, what do you think about health care coverage and the efforts in Washington re to repeal and replace Obamacare? Join tonight's conversation by visiting our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news at 7. And FYI, you can watch past discussions. They're on demand and available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. Thanks to all our guests for being here tonight. Keith Fitzgerald is a professor of political science at New College of Florida. Julio Gonzalez represents South Sarasota County in the Florida House and is an orthopedic surgeon. And Senator Pothoff is chair of the University of South Florida the Department of Health Policy and Management.